Um, so I'm Lane Atmore. Um, I'm a PhD research fellow at the University of Oslo. I work in the Center for Ecological and Evolutionary Synthesis with the Sea Changes ITN. Um, and I'm presenting a paper that we published last year on BAM score, which is a program that we wrote for an assignment test for ultra low coverage sequences. Um, so hopefully everybody's had a chance to at least look at the paper, um, but if you've only had time to skip, don't worry, because I'm going to go all in detail um, today. Um, but we published this last uh, November after putting together the program over the course of last year. <clears throat> and a little bit of background on why we wanted to make um, an assignment test program. Um, obviously, genomic assignment tests are a really important diagnostic tool for both ecological analysis and for ancient DNA. Um, it, this can provide information on uh, population of origin, ecotype assignment, uh, maybe identifying if something is a wild or a domesticate, maybe a hybrid. For ancient DNA, you can expend, extend this into population continuity, questions about evolution and climate change, maybe species migration, and then also looking at trade routes between different societies. Um, but the problem is a lot of genomic assignment tests rely on high coverage data. As we know, high coverage data is really expensive, um, and this can be difficult to attain for a lot of different types of studies, including ancient DNA. Um, and current genome sequencing strategies often try and get around this, which results in a proliferation of low coverage sequences. So for ecology, this often is reduced representation sequencing, genome skimming techniques, maybe genotyping that's set rays. For ancient DNA, this is more a brute force strategy where you take a bunch of bones or other types of samples and then you just extract from all of them and you try to screen them for are any of them good enough quality to sequence. And then only a few individuals are actually then sequenced further. So of course, there's this huge bottleneck of you put in all this effort and then you only get a few samples out of it in the end. So for particularly for ancient DNA, this means we destroy a lot of things and then we don't use them in the end. And this exacerbates a couple of the big ethical issues that we have in the field of archaeogenomics, like accessibility, the cost of lab work, the cost of sequencing, um, also the human time that it takes to do all of this stuff, as well as the responsibility for ethical destruction of archaeological material. Obviously, we're not getting any of this back when we do destroy it. Um, and I work on very small fish bones, so I have to destroy the whole thing, not just take a chunk. Um, so our question was, what can we do with these really low quality samples? Is there anything that we can do to address this issue or do we just have to go ahead and say, this is how ancient DNA works? Um, so in the past, there have been a couple of attempts to do assignment on low coverage sequences. Um, typically this was with sexing. So people would take sex chromosomes and then determine whether um, an individual was male or female. Usually this was with horses or humans. Um, and obviously sex chromosomes are very different physically, so this is easy to do with really low coverage data. Um, but our question was, why, why limit this to sexing? Because we know there are other types of variation that are also quite significant in the genome, one of which is chromosomal inversions. Um, so if you're not familiar, uh, a chromosomal inversion is basically a rearrangement where in some populations of a species, um, a portion of a chromosome will just be flipped um, to be running basically backwards. And this shows up in a lot of fish. Um, we are seeing it more in birds and plants as well. Um, and they tend to underlie local adaptation to different environments. And they seem to be associated with ecotypes um, in a, very, uh, a, a growing number of species. So for example, the impetus for this was um, variation in Atlantic cod, which have been shown to have several very large inversions that are associated with adaptations to different um, marine environments, as well as migratory or non-migratory behavior. So we developed this assignment test that can assign biologically relevant information like these structural variant haplotypes in extremely low coverage sequence data. And this is now freely available. Um, you can download the binaries off GitHub. Um, I've written all the instructions on there, but obviously if you're confused, just <laughs> send me an email. Um, but I'm just gonna go into detail about how we actually went about doing this, what's the, what's the statistics underlying it, and then some of the um, applications that we've been uh, running so far. 
So there are two main modules in the program. Um, first is you make a database. Yeah, so we create a reference database from allele frequencies that we pull out of moderate to high coverage individuals. So this means that you need to have some individuals that you can use as a reference set to then pull these out of your low coverage alignment files. Because once we've created this, we just take all of the loci in our database and we see how many of them we can find out of the alignment files. And then using um, what we find in the alignment files, we score them for likelihood of which population they belong to. So it's really simple. Um, and at, some, at this point, you might be asking, why wouldn't we just use a PCA? Um, we see this a lot where people do a PCA and they project their ancient individuals on top, or they just run a PCA with their heterochronous data. And that's how they do their assignment. And there are a couple of problems with this. Uh, the main one being that you really can't use heterochronous data in a PCA. Um, this is it. Like, I'm not going to get into all of the reasons why not, but if you're interested in this, I would highly recommend this paper, um, which came out a couple of years ago, um, about factor analysis, which is a new way of, of assigning ancient um, samples that gets around this issue of, of using the PCA. But their basic uh, conclusion is that when you do a PCA with heterochronic samples, the variation, the eigenvalues, will be basically informed only by the difference in time and not by the true variation that you see in those populations. So you're going to have a skewed estimate of where your populations really belong in the distribution. And you get a really similar thing when you do samples with really high differences in coverage. So if we're talking about really low coverage sequences, obviously we don't want to just plot them with a high coverage sequence because then the main variation will actually be just this axis in difference of coverage. So somehow we had to get around this. Um, and to do that, we developed the pipeline which relies on the on PCA without actually applying it to the ancient samples. So you take a VCF file, so you have, you know, X amount of individuals uh, from your reference data set. This could be modern individuals or ancient ones that you've maybe sequenced to a high enough coverage. And then we use Smart PCA to create a distribution of eigenvalues and SNP loading weights for this uh, reference database. So in this figure, we have here, this is an example from, uh, I think it's the linkage group one inversion on Atlantic Cod. Oh, I think I've lost my mouse. Oh, there we go. So this is the PCA of this inversion. Um, this is a pretty typical distribution for inversions. So you have the A type and then the B type, and then right in the middle, there are some individuals that are hybrid between the two haplotypes. And then we pulled out the SNP loading weight distribution. Um, so a SNP loading weight is basically a measure of how important that SNP is for determining the actual shape of the PCA. And we want to pull out just the most important SNPs for doing our reference database because we want to eliminate as much noise as possible. So in this analysis, we pulled out, I think, just the top 5% or so of SNPs here. And I'm going to go a little bit more in detail about that later. Um, Yeah, so then we have our database created. So that's at the bottom of this figure here. Um, so we take the genotypes of the type A and the type B um, haplotypes for both the major allele and the minor allele. And then we store the allele frequencies of each of those as well. And that is what our database is, is comprised of. And then there is actually a manual step here where uh, you take the eigen distribution from PCA, you put it into something like Excel, and then you say, okay, based on PC1, um, which populations are type A and which populations are type B, and then you use that um, to input into the, the next module. We did try and automate this, um, but because there's so much variation in different data sets, it's actually, we do recommend doing it manually. Um, so after you've got your database, then you want to obviously score your alignment files. So we use the diversion SNPs database to pull the low side of interest from our alignment files. 
So we just open up the file and we go through and say, okay, at this locus, do we have any reads? At this locus, do we have any reads? At that locus, do we have any reads? And then we put together <clears throat> a database for each alignment files um, with each of the genotypes. And then we say that the genotype for a position is the read, the allele with the highest representation of reads. So basically just the most commonly genotype that we have in our, in our file. And then we compare that to our reference database and we use the allele frequencies of the reference database as a proxy for what the allele frequencies of that genotype should be in a wild population. So in this example, um, chromosome one position 568 um, has a genotype of A in our alignment file. So we can see that in the type A haplotype major alleles, there is a type A there's a, um, an allele of A, and then in the type B minor allele database, there's also a type A. And then we say, okay, so the likelihood of there being a type A, uh, an allele of A in the type A um, database is 95%, whereas it's 2% in the like a likelihood that it is in the BV database. And so then we just use that to say, okay, so this is the approximate likelihood, and then this locus belongs to that. Uh, population. And then we just do a joint probability estimation of all of the loci that we can find per sample. Um, <clears throat> and then we score that, sorry, we score that to one. So what you get at the end is you get a list of your individuals, you get your type A, your type B, and your hybrid type. Um, and then we say, okay, uh, how many SNPs did we actually find out of your network of SNPs database? Because you will get a read, you will get some sort of assignment, even if there's one SNP that you found. So it's good to know, okay, did we actually do this based on like a, a large proportion of SNPs from our database or was it just one or two low side and should we trust that result? <clears throat> so we applied BAM score to three species with non-structural variants. Um, the first was Atlantic herring. Um, which has an inversion that is associated with adaptation to salinity. Um, it's eight megabases. Then we did Atlantic cod, which was obviously in the example from figure one. Um, and this is the inversion associated with migratory behavior. And this one is 16 megabases. And then to get away from fish and to show that it's not just a fish program, uh, we also did Heliconius butterflies. They have several different inversions that are associated with wing pattern morphs. And so we just pulled one of them out. Um, and this one was only 1.1 megabases. So we had quite a range of size of inversions as well. And then we thought, well, it's actually not reliant on anything to do with inversions, really. Um, we don't look for LD breakpoints. We don't look for actual structural variation. We're just looking for allele frequencies. So the approach is really quite flexible and doesn't necessarily have to be limited to inversions. As long as you have enough differentiation in the system, you should be able to score um, an assignment based on your allele frequencies. So we thought, okay, we will then apply this to a whole genome data set as well to see if we can do this on a genome-wide basis and not just in one haplotype. Um, <clears throat> for the genome-wide though, we don't do this uh, heterozygous haplotype in the middle because the way that we calculate that is to just take a 50% of type A and type B. Um, and obviously you wouldn't have that for genome-wide variation where you would in an inversion, which is really just half and half if they're heterozygotes. Um, for each species then we created uh, two sets of databases or two databases per species. So we had our reference database and we had our scoring database. And the reference database um, was a range of different uh, sizes. So you can see we had 20, 19, and then 276 um, in our three different species. And then we scored only alignment files that we knew where they came from, so that we knew whether or not we were actually doing this right. Uh, so we had 40 um, individuals that we scored for the Heliconius butterflies, nine from the Atlantic herring, and 15 from the Atlantic hog. Um, and then you can see also that we had a really big variance in the number of SNPs that we had in our database. So for the, for the butterflies, this is a really small inversion. We only had 1,700 SNPs. And then for the genome-wide uh, COD assignment, we had 220,000. 
And the scoring database, uh, we took all of these alignment files and then we randomly downsampled them so that we knew exactly how many reads were in each file, going up in increments of like 1,000 at a time. And then we bootstrapped that over 20 iterations. So for each read depth, we had 20 different alignment files that were all randomly downsampled. Um, and then we ran the BAM score on that to assess sensitivity. So I think this is figure two in the paper. Um, this is our inversion and population databases. So you can see that for each of the four different tests, there's really high differentiation. Um, for the inversion sites, that's the first three PCAs, they do show that classic one, two, three distribution. And then on the Atlantic Cod whole genome, which is at the bottom, we actually removed all of the inversion sites um, in the Cod genome there and just did everything else. Um, but they do show an FST of 0.1 uh, from the Eastern to the Western Atlantic. And then we looked at the SNP loading weights. Um, so you can see that in red, this, these are the weights that we actually decided to pick for our divergence SNPs database. And they are very different depending on which test we did. And that's because we noticed that depending on what type of test you're doing, so the whole genome versus an inversion, maybe the different sizes of the inversion or like how well separated the two types are, um, it's really easy to introduce noise which can greatly limit your ability to accurately assign um, the alignment files. And so we not only tested um, how, how far down we can go in read depth, but also how many SNPs we actually need as a minimum number or a maximum number of SNPs. And we did that by proxy of pulling out different SNP weights. Um, and because we saw such variation, we have added an argument into the program where you can actually select what weight you want to pull, just the top or the bottom of the distribution is symmetrical. Um, and then you can assess uh, if that changes the results at all. And then we ran it on all of our bootstrap files. So you can see that there is quite a bit of variation in how well the assignment test works. Um, but the quote worst performing one was the Heliconius and we were able to score them with uh, 10,000 reads which is approximately 0.009x coverage for the Heliconius genome. So that is very, very low. And that was being brought down by the heterozygotes, which are much more difficult to score. Um, for the Atlantic herring, we only actually had one type. So we weren't able to compare this with the A or the AB types, um, but we were able to correctly assign all of them to the B type at 0.004x coverage. And this was actually with ancient DNA, not just with downsampled ones. Um, and the Atlantic cod were also with ancient DNA. Um, and those performed really the best. I mean, you can see with the whole genome assignment test, you're doing it with basically a thousand reads. Um, it's really, really effective. Oops, I've talked ahead of my own slideshow. <laughs> Classic. Uh, yeah, and then and then we have, we also we didn't really report this too much in the study, but we've run it on a bunch of different uh, data sets now, and you can scale it up to millions of reads. It might run a little bit slower if you have millions of reads, but it will still give you a result. Um, and then to talk a little bit about the SNP weight again, uh, so if we go back to the Heliconius butterflies, you remember how the heterozygotes were much harder to score than the homozygotes, and um, this is probably because for Heliconius, they're not fully separated, these two inversion types. Um, and we found that if we increased the SNP weight greater than 2% on the tail end of the distribution, we completely lost the ability to identify heterozygotes. But if we had it at 2%, then we could still do decently well. Um, so this just highlights that it's really important to look at your data as you're doing this and that um, each system can be really different. Um, so, of course, for a genomic assignment test, you do have to have reference data. Um, this is not always possible for everyone. So if you don't have reference data, then you probably wouldn't be able to use the test. Um, but there really isn't much we can do about that. Um, the other thing is that you will always get a result from this. So you could put in something that you know, has one SNP in common with your A or your type B uh, samples. And it, and it will tell you, oh, it's 
likely to be type A. So it's a question of, do you trust that? Do you know which SNP that was maybe? Um, how important is this SNP for your biological system? So it's important to know both uh, your biological system for setting up, uh, for interpreting your results, but also for setting up the analysis. So are you using the right populations in your reference database, for example? <clears throat> uh, as I said, um, visualizing the SNP loading distribution is a really good idea. And then we also recommend doing this bootstrap approach um, because then you can determine like at what read depth can I actually accurately sign this. So that's what I've been doing with some of my other samples now saying uh, which ones can I use and can I not use um, based on these tests. Um, for heterozygous individuals, this requires a few more reads um, as we saw with the heliconius, but it's still really, really low. And this is obviously only possible for structural variants like inversions. Um, the other thing is that we can only do two populations at a time right now, which does slow you down a little bit, but we found that you can do really a hierarchical approach. So let's say you have um, for fish, for example, on the eastern or the western side of the ocean, you know there's differentiation. So you can first say which side of the ocean do they come from? And then within those sides, maybe you have other types of differentiation. So you can like slowly fine tune your way to actually saying what's the final assignment for this. Um, we've talked about adding more populations for future versions of it, um, which we're not developing currently, but we might in the future. And yeah, so this is a way that we can do assignment test while getting around this bias of heterochronicity um, in, the, in uh, PCA. And we think that there are some pretty cool applications to conservation genomics and wildlife forensics. Um, but I think probably the biggest application currently is that it increases the amount of usable specimens that can be recovered, uh, re usable data that can be recovered from ancient specimens. And just, just to illustrate how effective this can be without actually going into detail about any of the work that I'm doing right now. <laughs> Um, so I have archaeological samples from Atlantic herring from 1200 to 600 years ago, um, actually 400 years ago, not 600, but um, I'm looking at genome-wide variation and chromosomal inversions, trying to assign where these herring come from. And I have so far been able to use species with coverage that gets down to 0.007x and endogenous DNA content of 1% which is, I mean, basically you would have thrown that in the trash, right? Like totally unusable. And this means that out of the 16 sites that I sampled, I can use 15 of them with at least one sequence that tells me where those bones come from. And the one that I'm missing, I actually only had one bone from and it just happened not to work. And that is 64% of all of the destroyed bones. So I think it's something like 75 out of 130 bones that I've worked on now. Um, and just to contrast this with some of the more traditional sequencing um, methods, uh, well, not sequencing methods, but the more traditional analysis methods, um, I think I'm going to have around 15 that I can fully deep sequence. So that's obviously way, way less. That's something like 10% instead of 64%. Um, and yeah, we are applying this to a lot of different species now in Oslo, um, and we're planning to do even more in the future. Um, we're really excited about it. And yeah, thanks to all of the collaborators and thanks to you guys for having me. Um, hopefully it's useful. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs>